storyteller, um, earned degrees from UCLA, USC, and Harvard. So smart. Um, and her debut novel, The Secrets of Mary Bowser, came out last year, and it's been called Magnificently Written and a Riveting and Powerful Book. Um, yes. And um, after the show, we'll have some of those books for sale. If you want to get one, she'll sign it for you. And a couple of fun facts. Uh, she also plays the accordion, though, as she says, not very well. Um, and she's a regular bike commuter, and her bike has a fierce leopard pattern on it because she loves everything a leopard. Um, and she uh, wrote this story just for tonight's show. Um, please welcome to the stage your next storyteller, Lois Levine. Or 20 years. 
and they they got it down to a science. Like they always pack a Jewish cookbook so that whoever they hire to be the cook locally can make things like cookbook. Can't pronounce things like cookbook, but can make things like cookbook. So we ate some really rocking cookbook for the Indian Reservation. Um, but in order to get food, now 12 teenagers plus the two college counselors and the two directors. Uh, the, one of the camp directors had to drive over an hour away each day to get food at the nearest supermarket, which was its own kind of cultural exchange. Um, she was amazed to discover that they actually had Hebrew national salami <laughs> at, the, at the supermarket in South Dakota. But when she went to buy it the first time, the person working behind the deli counter said, you should try a piece first. You might not like it. It's got the kosher in it. <laughs> So construction work is not our strong suit. I have never picked up a hammer or a saw before, and now I'm here and for seven and a half hours a day doing construction work. The only thing I have going for me is that when you are spending all that time going from the racks to the communal dressing room and women's schlepping clothing, you do build up some upper arm construction project and it started to rain and we were rained out on the work site. Now then we had to entertain ourselves inside. We were staying in the reservation school. So we had to figure out what we would do all that time inside. And I had this bright idea that we should make chocolate chip cookies, right? Rainy day chocolate chip cookies seemed very nice. Um, but of course the camp director is long gone on that over an hour trek each way to the supermarket. So as we're driving back from the rained out work site to the site where we're staying, we stop at what is the only store on the reservation. Um, it's a little convenience store and if you can imagine the crappiest inner city bodega you have ever seen, right? Crowded, not a lot of selection, and everything is really overpriced, but there is nothing else for 40 miles around. And we get there, and the camp counselors say, well, Lois, it's your right idea to make the cookies. You can go inside, and they send in one of the other teams with me. And we get inside, and we're looking around, trying to find you know, brown sugar, baking soda, in this crummy little store. And all of a sudden, it occurs to me that we are the only white people there. And in fact, it's not even that that's what occurs to me. What occurs to me is that everybody in the store who's Native American is looking at us. And some of them seem curious, and some of them seem a little hostile, and some of them seem very friendly, and some of them seem like they just are, can't wait for us to get out of there. And it occurs to me that whatever they are thinking, and it might be any of those emotions, but they're thinking it just because we're white. And suddenly I realize that that's what racism is, right? Uh, you know, Jews are less than 3% of the population. But when you grow up in Dix Hills, Long Island, New York, the fact that you're a minority is more conceptual than very visceral. This was very visceral. And I didn't feel scared. Uh, I didn't feel worried about our safety. I just felt like, oh, holy crap. This is what it must be like if you are black or Native American or a person of color every day. That every situation you are in, you have the sense of being judged based just on your race. Um, it, of course, that's not all there is to racism. And I think being on the reservation, I learned that too, that there are sort of structural and systemic ways that racism works. So when you're a nice Jewish girl from Long Island, your whole childhood is spent with people telling you if you do well in school, you'll get into a good college. If you get into a good college, you'll get a good job. If you get a good job, you'll have a nice life. If you're growing up on an Indian reservation where the unemployment rate is 85%, it doesn't matter how you do in school, right? There are no good jobs to have. And so thinking about how different that was for the teens that we were meeting in South Dakota versus this group of teens whose parents had sent us off to do volunteer work. So my mother is right, as it turns out. This gives me some very interesting things to write about on my college essays. And as you heard, I wind up at Harvard University, but I'm so interested 
in race and ethnicity. I major in American history and literature so that I can read about race and ethnicity. And then I end up going to graduate school and getting a PhD, which I would like to point out takes longer than going to medical school, even though my mother thinks I'm not a real doctor. <laughs> which is on African American literature, I read a book about black women's history, and I read about Mary Bowser, who was a, this amazing woman who was born into slavery in Richmond, Virginia. She was freed and sent north to be educated, and then she made the rather unusual choice of going back to the South, where during the Civil War, she became a spy for the Union <coughs> Army by pretending to be a slave in the Confederate White House. Uh, yeah, this is kind of an amazingly cool story and a great way to get people thinking about race because like if you want to talk about people judging you based on how you look or how you fight systemic structural racism, like Mary Bowser's story seems really the way to do that. So uh, there's not enough about her to write a biography, I decide that I'm going to write a novel. The only thing is that you can't really write a book about somebody who's a black woman, who's a spy during the Civil War, unless you know something about the Civil War. So I start this project, and I don't know my Antietam from my elbow. But as I proceed, it turns out that the Civil War, which you know many of you probably even when I say Civil War are cringing me because it seems so boring. The way we had to learn it in school, where you had to memorize the names of battlefields, the dates of battles, the names of generals, and how people were but all of a sudden, when I was thinking about it from Mary's point of view, what would it be like to be this young woman being judged as one thing when you're really something else, knowing you have a secret agenda? It seemed really fascinating to me. So I write the novel. And there's a joke among novelists that everybody's first novel is autobiographical. Didn't seem to me like this could be the case for me. <laughs> She is black, she's a slave, she's in 19th century America. From the first page of the novel, her mother is having these regular conversations with Jesus. She's definitely not a Jewish girl from Long Island. The first place that I ended up doing a reading from the book was at the Oregon Jewish Museum. And I'm a little nervous going into the event because I think, well, what's going to happen when they find out that Mary's mother's talking to Jesus? Like, they're going to run me out of the Jewish Museum, Jewish authors of it, because this is so not Jewish. Then I thought about it a little more. And you know, like, Mary's mother, as it turns out, is actually very much a Yiddish mom, right? She's pushing her daughter. She wants her daughter to get an education. When Mary is free, she has to leave her family to go north, right? But her mother wants her to do that. And for Mary, the north is the same kind of promised land that America was for the Jews of my grandparents' generation, right? So they're coming from Europe to, uh, to New York. She's going from Virginia to Philadelphia. That, um, you know, she's sometimes reluctant about her role, but that makes her kind of like Moses or Daniel or our personal favorite, Esther, right? People who are told they have a mission and they're a little reluctant about it. Um, and Mary is 13. In the way I tell her story, when she goes from the south to the north, and only after I finish the book that I think, like, 13? Oh yeah, she has, she's like bought mitzvah out into freedom to take this on. And then if you think about giving up your freedom to go back into slavery to try and free four million other enslaved people, that's like the ultimate act of Sadaka or to put along. She's really good at to save the world. So I just have decided over time that Mary is Jewish, or at least my being Jewish is part of how Mary got to be who she is. I spent my childhood reading books like When Hitler Stole Pink Rabbit or The Endless Step. These you know girl heroes who are fighting anti-Semitism in World War II here in Europe. And in a way, that's kind of what inspires me to love a story like Mary's story. So I think I probably am the only Jewish woman from Long Island who knows that the Fort Pillow Massacre does not refer to an ugly scene at a white sale. <laughs> but it doesn't matter because, you know, it turns out the more in touch you are with your Jewish self, the more you learn to love the Civil War. 